one of the forwards in the big book. Yeah. To me, it's a very important statement where he talks about we are a hundred men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. That word seemingly is defined as it appears to be true or false to you. <clears throat> so when you're under the throes of alcoholism, at that point, it seems to me that it's a hopeless state of mind and body. So it's quite logical to keep on getting loaded. Because I don't see anything really changing. Yeah? And the inevitability of that fear, the only way I can put it off is to stay oblivious, basically. So I don't want to become conscious of that fact that I'm totally screwed. So my solution is the screwing of myself, basically, every day. To try to stay away from that sense of being totally screwed which I deeply feel, based on what's happened all those years, yeah? So I would drink to stay unconscious of the fact that I was in a hopeless state of mind and body. But then, in the program, it says it's a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, and it appears to be true or false to me, yeah? And so it introduces my role in it, which is a rather big role. Yeah? That the appearance of it being so hopeless is based on me. Therefore, the solution in a way is going to be based on me. To a point where I will do something, which is the 12 steps, and that seemingly will move from seemingly being a hopeless state of minding body to realizing that I'm not in a hopeless state of mind and body. How? By just opening my eyes and seeing other people who have recovered from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And people, some people say you have to make a leap of faith in AA, but I don't see there's a leap of faith at all. I think the leap of faith is going back into the reliance of self-centeredness. It's never worked, and yet you keep having faith in the system that it will work. In recovery, you just see it working everywhere you go. Yeah. So they have step one, which is that we admit that we were powerless over alcohol, and that our lives have become unmanageable. <clears throat> There's another point in the book in how it works, where they describe the 12 steps, and it's a perfectly named chapter. It's basically how it works, the program, which is rooted in these 12 principles. And they say, <clears throat> we do these 12 steps, and it gets to a point, after they state what they are, they say, uh, you, we have to become convinced of, of three pertinent facts. Yeah? And our experiences before and after getting sober, before and after, will verify them. And the first one is that we're alcoholics and we cannot manage our own lives. Yeah? Now that sounds totally different than how I read the first step when I came in. When I read the first step, it sounded like my unmanageability was produced by my drinking and using. And I believe that if I stopped drinking and using, then things would become manageable. Yeah? Just that's the logic, how I read it. Because it sounded that, like the way I heard that language, it was like, all right, I'm powerless over alcohol, and my life has become unmanageable, as if it had been manageable at one point. Yeah? So I was just under this assumption that, all right, when I stop drinking and using, everything's going to chill out and get better. Then I was, in, in, I was, I was going to have many rude awakenings that that wasn't true. Because I had attributed a lot of my behavior at this point to my cocaine use, and other use, and then when I stopped using it, that behavior still kept coming up. So it, it, its life wasn't based on the drug use. It was amplified by the drug use, but its life didn't, didn't stem from the drug use. The, it was born before the drug use. The possibility of it was way before I used coke. The coke just amplified it, you know? So I would blame certain things like where I would I would get very paranoid in significant relationships with females, yeah? 
if it was a casual relationship, there was no threat there. But if the love was on the table, I was very paranoid that I was going to get hurt. And I thought that paranoia was produced by my cocaine use. But I got sober, and in the first relationships I started getting into in, in, in AA, it came up. Yeah? The same pattern. That was incredibly a rude awakening. So I much like it, I like it much better the way it's stated in, at the end of how it works, which is I'm an alcoholic and I cannot manage up my own life. Because I really believe the act of uh, expression of the disease now in my life is not drinking and using, it's managing. Yeah? It's the mind's position of being the doer and the haver and the feeler. Yes? It's that sense of being the one prior to all the actions and all the feelings and all the thoughts and the managing of that, all those relationships which is causing the unmanageability. Yeah? So it's actually my managing that's making everything unmanageable. Yeah? And it says in the book that one of the main delusions a lot of people have who have alcoholism is that they believe still against all the evidence contrary, that if they could only learn how to manage better, then everything would get great. So they're not willing to give up the managing, they just want to get better at it, yeah? That's, and it says it's one of the major delusions of a lot of people, yeah? Because that statement is, I'm an alcoholic and I cannot manage all my lives, and I have enough information before I was sober to prove to verify that, and after I was sober to verify that. So the managing crosses the line. It doesn't stop. The unmanageability doesn't stop when the drinking stops because it didn't start when the drinking started. Yeah? To me, it's really important to see because the unmanageability is the root of the problem. In hindsight, you could actually say my drinking was a solution coming from my managing to the problem of alcoholism. So I got relief when I drank. I needed more relief, so I had to start using drugs. Yeah? And then the drug had to get elevated because I still needed relief. And then I had to change the way I used drugs to try to still get more relief. Yeah? Because it wasn't working. It only temporarily worked. But basically, the drinking and the using was a solution to the problem of unmanageability. And it doesn't work because it came from the system of unmanageability. Yeah? So then it says, all right, you go to step two, which is to me an observational step. People, a lot of, and this is just my experience, my opinion. A lot of people view it a different way. And step two is that we come, we came to believe, which means it's an after, yeah? We came, so it's already seemed to occur. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Yeah? Now this, to the, to restore us to sanity. So a lot of people get mixed up with this where they think they're still insane now, but AA has a specific goal. It's the insanity that it precedes the first drink. That's where you get restored to sanity. Yeah? Because it's the first drink that gets you drunk. Yes? It's the first drug that it's sort of like, as soon as you see alcoholism can't pick up a beer. It has to use the body and it has to convince the mind to do something that's insane to do after all the evidence in your life telling you this is a crazy idea. It has to have an incredible strategy because it's a parasite that doesn't have the means to get its fuel. It needs to co-opt the system that has the ability to go out and pick up, yeah, to get what it needs. It can't go shopping. Alcoholism can't go to the liquor store, yeah. It has to convince you and I to, that it's a good idea to have a drink. So how does this parasite of alcoholism do it? In my view, how it did it, because if you, let's say if a big bug flew in here right now, big, big, big bug, landed on your arm, your immediate reaction would be to knock it off, right? Immediate. There would be no thought about it. You wouldn't go, oh, is this some, something nice? You know, just boom, like that, yeah? If it flew back again, boom. Flew back again, boom, yeah? Anyone who's ever been taken over by the parasite of alcoholism knows it's a hostile takeover. It's not a benign takeover. 
It's not a benevolent takeover, basically, yeah? So how does this parasite succeed? It has to have an incredible strategy, yeah? Or any host whatsoever would immediately throw it off. This parasite jacks into the thought system, yeah? And infects the thought system that's producing the sense of self and takes on the role of being the self that you take yourself to be. So, no matter how bad it gets, you can't entertain being free from it because you're identified as it. So the best thing you can do is maybe get therapy for it, maybe try to socialize it, maybe hide the drinking, maybe try to limit the drinking, try to control the drinking, go and get dried out and just to do another run. But your mind is inhibited to entertain the only freedom there is, is and that is from it, because you're identified as it. So the host cannot entertain that it can free, be free from the parasite because it takes itself to be the parasite. Yeah? So here we are at step two. What happens? You come into the program and there's suggestions. And if you follow those suggestions, in a short bit of time and going to meetings and you'll see other people who have followed the suggestions, you'll see that the suggestions work. It was so obvious to me. I couldn't stop drinking and using came in AA and for three weeks I hadn't drank or used. I now was living in a guest hotel, uh, bought a ghetto box, was, got a job, and I hadn't drank in three weeks. I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity because I was experiencing being restored to sanity concerning the first drink. I wasn't taking it anymore. Yeah? It was an observational step. I saw it. It was brought about by admitting the first step and then taking the suggestions. It wasn't enough just to admit the first step. I needed to take the suggestions that were offered because then the demonstration of all these people getting restored to sanity and in my own experience being restored to sanity concerning drinking and using was available. What leap of faith is there? It's observational. It's happening. It's not like you're hoping it's going to happen. When you first walk in, it's hope. But it turns into belief very quickly, yeah? And then that feet, belief galvanizes into faith. That's when emotional sobriety is offered, yeah? Something can stabilize. So then the second step to me is just an observational step. You take the suggestions, yeah? You follow some of the things we do, and you see that it works. And then you observe other people doing the same thing, and you see that it works. Then maybe you see someone that you'd say, man, I used, to get, I used to get loaded with this guy and now he's been sober and clean five years. You're like, wow, Jesus Christ. And then you start seeing, hey, I've been sober a month. Where's the leap of faith? It's all observational, yeah? So then it goes to step three. Step three is the step of, let's say, the turning point. First of all, you have all this evidence that you're powerless over this stuff called alcohol. Yeah? And that you know, or drugs and or drugs and your life has become unmanageable. But because you're unmanaged, you're, you're, the condition of an alcoholic state is unmanageability. And it's expressed through managing. Yeah? So you're clear on that. You're now getting relieved. You're now starting to believe that something greater than yourself can restore you to sanity. And so here's the deal. Are you willing or are you interested in turning your will in your life? Because this is the level of expression, is your will in life. Are you willing to turn over this possibility or opportunity of expressing over to this power greater than yourself, over to the caring? Yeah? Over to the caring. It's sort of like what we did with my mother when she got old. We put her into a senior citizen home and she was under their care. Yeah? When she first moved in there, because she had been locked in her apartment and sometimes she couldn't get to the kitchen, She'd pass out in her wheelchair, and she couldn't move, yeah? She couldn't eat, so she had a fear of being taken care of, this and that. And after a period of time of being taken care of every day at the senior citizen, every day they brought lunch and breakfast, that fear was removed. Not by a leap of faith, but just by the evidence that she was being taken care of, yeah? So it says, to turn your woolly life over to the care of a higher power. I'm going to go this quick. But... If you look at it as a linear process, which it is, you can't go from the first step to the ninth step, yeah? 
Because from the first step point of view, where you're there, you'll say, I can never do the ninth step. But if you do the next eight steps, then you'll be ready to do the ninth step when you arrive. So each one is a certain process that produces your willingness for the next part of the process. But the third step says, all right, you're going to turn your willing life over to the care of a higher power of your own understanding. And it says, you know what's going to happen if you sincerely take this position yeah, of reliance on a power greater than yourself, you'll realize you have a new employer in this life. And you'll realize, not believe hope, but you'll come to realize, because it will demonstrate it to be so, that this employer, being all-powerful, will take care of you with only two requirements. If you perform his works well or its works well, and you stay close to it. And one of them is already done. You can't be far away from it. If, it, if you remember when you were, I went to Catholic school, they used to have the three qualities of the supposed God, which was omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotent. In other words, it's everywhere, it's all-powerful and all-knowing. So to stay, stay close to everywhere isn't difficult, is it? Because it's anywhere you are. So all you've got to do is perform his works well. You do some service. You participate and get in with yourself and help other people get out of themselves in a way. <clears throat> but before you get there, so it says, all right, so you've sincerely taken this position, okay? And what's going to happen is these, these effects are going to occur. And they're going to start expressing themselves to you. And then it says, all right, now if, if you did that, if you get established in that position, which is reliance on something greater than yourself, yeah? If you get established there, now all these different effects will show up, yeah? You'll feel a new power flow in. You'll start feeling some freaking juice, yeah? You'll realize that you can face life successfully. You'll be able to enjoy peace of mind. You'll actually sense the presence of this higher power, yeah? Now this is a big leap from just having a sense that you're under a new employer's jurisdiction. Now you're getting all this these effects just by take, just having the mind take a different position, yeah? But it says, so here you go from first step, second step, to the third step. But before, in the beginning of the third step, it says, if you look at it linear, something really important. And to me, it's like the unspoken step of AA, which is, it says, first of all, you've got to quit playing God. First of all, in the, you've got to quit playing God. And the reason why, it doesn't work. <laughs> which I love <laughs> it just doesn't work yeah? and if you have been under that, that auspices of playing God you know that for, to, for a fact quit playing God it doesn't work yeah? and then it says next in this drama of life God will be the director you'll be his children stuff like that so if you look at it as a linear procession I would say first comes before next yeah First is very, very important for the next to have any value. So for me, the managing, the playing God is in the aspect of the disease called managing. Yeah? That's where the playing God is happening. And that's happening before and after you drink. Yeah? The powers of alcohol isn't happening after you drink. You're not drinking. Yeah? But the managing is happening before and after. So I find a lot of people don't address that one. And sometimes, let's say if you surrender your will and your life over the care of a higher power from the point of view of self, you have an amendment to that, you have an exemption to that, you have a reservation to that, which is, I can always take it back. So people's experience with surrender is, I surrendered, then I took it back, and then shit hit the fan, and I surrendered again, but then I wanted this, this relationship, I took it back, or, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. To me, that's plain God, yeah? The hope, that's like the God that you're surrendering to is a little God, and you're like the big bully. So you give the little kid your candy, and then when you want it back, you go, tch, 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 give me that candy back, and you take it back. You look like the bigger God, in my view, to that, in that picture, yes? If the God you're hurt turning it over, you can take it back from, I don't think that's God. <laughs> I think you're playing God. But that, So this whole idea of this experience of surrendering and then not... This idea of surrendering can stabilize into surrender, yeah? Where you're convinced of the situation you seem to be in, yeah? And you're now getting pretty convinced that there is a solution. It can come to an end, this little back and forth, this and that, surrender, not surrender, surrender, not surrender. And you'll get surrendered, in a way, yeah? 
So it stabilizes. It's not as romantic and, and dramatic as surrendering and, not, and then taking it back and then surrendering again. That's actually pretty cool in a lot of ways. You get off on it. But you never really, you're never really guaranteed that you're going to surrender after you take it back. It can go for months and uh, hell can really break loose. So I'd much rather be in surrender. It's much more, it's much nicer, stable way to go. So there's the third step. So then people go, all right, my idea of surrender would be this, in my idea. Surrender would be life got to a point where I felt totally beaten and everything like that. Then I, claimed, I climbed up to a peak with a beautiful vista, yes? I took my hat off, my long hair was going, and I, and I had some previous girlfriends there to witness it, and I, I gave up nobly, I surrender. Oh, and then the wind was blowing, and maybe there was thunder and lightning, and it was this big event. But they say, no, go home and do an inventory. Now that's not the way I thought surrender would look. Yeah? I didn't think I needed to do anything after I surrendered. I figured it was done, that was over. But they say, no, the third step is just a decision, and then the actual act, action of the surrender isn't the way you think surrender should be. It's going home and writing stuff down and taking a look at what? At how self-defeated you. Yeah? Now, there's a point when it goes into this fourth step, which is the inventory process, which it says very, 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 very clearly. First it describes it as looking at it as like a business and seeing what's unsaleable and stuff like that, and doing an honest appraisal of your life and see where you stand. And usually, the, usually it's broken down into three columns and stuff like that. And most people, it has this beautiful statement. It says, being convinced, which means to believe with certainty, that self, yeah, manifested in various ways, is what has defeated us. So there's a separation between you and self, which is beautiful, really. Self, yeah, manifested in various ways. Fear, anxiety, you know, all this stuff, is what has defeated us. First, be convinced of that. When you're convinced of that, it says, now we're going to look at its, meaning self's, common manifestations. Yeah? So first you're convinced, you've got the idea, you've had enough evidence, you're becoming clear of what's happened to you in your life, and he's giving you the key to freedom, basically. He's saying, being convinced of this, that self is manifest in all these ways is what has defeated us, we will now look at its common manifestations. Yeah? So some of the common manifestations of self. The next paragraph, it says the word resentment. So resentment is one of the first things you do an inventory on. Your anger and, and, and uh, feeling resentful about things that have happened to you. Yes? Then the second aspect is fear. So you write about fear. And then the third one is you take a topic where a lot of activity goes on in, which is sexual instinct. Yeah? And you look at how you harm people in the pursuit of what you wanted. Yes? That's the basic introductory inventory. But if you follow the logic of the statement, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us, and then it says we will now look at some of its common manifestations, and then resentment is the first thing, that's what? A common manifestation of self. And he's already separated that self isn't you. Yeah? Self has defeated us. What's that us? Who, what is that us? It's not self. He didn't, it doesn't say self-defeated itself. It says self-defeated us. Yeah? Manifested in various ways. Resentment. That's one of the various ways. Okay? So if you look at it this way, everyone in a bar tonight, in the fourth column, in the fourth step inventory, everyone in the bar does the first two columns. They know why they're mad and who they're mad at. They're clear about that. But there's no solution in that. You've got to turn the light upon yourself. That's where the solution lies, because you, in a sense, are the problem. Yeah? So you write a column, first column, maybe you put down the institutions you're mad at, like meter maids, the police, the court system, yes, my mother, my father, my girlfriends. Yeah? You write down people, institutions, and things. You write down why you're mad at them. Very simple, very easy. Then you look at it, the gauge you weigh everything with is your instinctual agenda. That's how AA offers it. You look at, how did it affect my 
my personal in, my personal instincts, my drive for like fame and adulation and acknowledgement, self esteem, my relationships, my material security, my emotional security, yeah, needing a place to stay, food and shelter, and all like that, and how it's expanded into I need a big house on the cliff and all like that, and my sexual instincts, yeah, and my ambitions concerning all of those agendas, yes. So we look at that, and what happens is you write this stuff out. And then you get to the fourth column, and you ask yourself a simple question. Well, where was I consider, inconsiderate, selfish, dishonest, and self-seeking? Yes? So now you've turned the light off of them, what happened, and you turned it on you. And you just answer simply, all right, well, I was selfish there, a simple thing. Let's say my girlfriend, Wendy, left me. I'm mad at her because she left me. Yeah? What, how did it affect me? Well, she was rich and I'm not. So now, you know, I had the BMW, and now I've got to pull the pinto out of the garage, yeah? I was, you know, she affected my sexual ambitions. I used to sleep with the maid, and now it's her and the maid are gone. I can't sleep with her. You know what I mean? I was, self, I was selfish and self-seeking. I didn't really want to be with Wendy anyway, really. But the material security was driving me. I, needed, I liked the money, and I was willing to sort of play the game as long as I kept getting the money and the BMW and stuff like that. So a lot's revealed, yes? Then you go to that fourth column and you see a lot's revealed. After a while, you get a few names on there, you're going to see a pattern of how self defeats you. Just like it says. You'll see all the various manifestations lead to one culprit in a way. Yeah? And the way it has sway over your life is that it's running the show. You're identified as it and it's attempting to manage the show. And it's unmanageability, this is the refuse. All the resentments, all the fears, all the harmings of other people are the, are the pollution of self trying to process this place, yes? It's producing it all. When you see the pattern, what happens? You've now recognized something that you weren't recognizing. You see now how you've been defeated. Yeah? You're waking up. You're waking up. Instead of just looking from the beast, you're now seeing the beast. Yeah? There's a separation being built. So now you're on the, you see that, and you share this with somebody, and they point out to you what you're not seeing. You share it with another person and this higher power. Yeah? It's a trinity going on. And this is called the fifth step. So you go it over with somebody, this information, and they point out to you what you may not be seeing, and you start seeing the basic way self defeats you in one's life. What happens then? Well, then there's step six, which is you become entirely ready to have this stuff, which you've just discovered, yeah, which is going to reappear in your life, but now you're going to probably see it. Yeah? So what before, maybe you noticed something, some behavior of self that took you over four months later. Now you sometimes see it when it's cooking. Yeah? And when you see it, at that moment you go, hey, I'm entirely ready to have this, which is cooking right now, removed, yeah? You ask this power, and it, so that's step seven. You humbly ask this power to remove it, this power, whatever you want to give it, name to it. So, but first there's recognition, willingness, recognition, and then release in a way. You don't manage it. All you do is tell the truth about it, yeah? You've been given the eyes to see it through the fourth step. You've seen the, in the fifth step. Now you start seeing the patterns in your life that you weren't seeing. So that's six and seven. That thing continues on and on and on and on and on. Yeah? And the, for me, the best thing is if you can see it when it's being cooked, it's got more juice to be let go of. And if you see it, let's say if you're sitting in a meeting and people are sharing, and you recognize one of the patterns of how you've been defeated, but the thing, because the thing is, here is all these people in the program. Most of us are walking in with a great sense of terminal uniqueness. We think we're very unusual and very unique. No one thinks like us. No one's done what we've done. No one feels like us. And you keep listening to people share at meetings, and you realize either two things are going on. How did these people get my thoughts? How did they get my feelings? You know? you have How are they to see it? Yes? Mm -hmm. So at that point, I like to do it at meetings. So someone's sharing, and I hear it, and I recognize that pattern because it's been in my life. At that moment in the meeting, I say six and seven. I say, hey, I'm entirely ready to have this, the thing I just heard, removed. And I humbly ask you to remove. I think there's more juice there because in, sex, in, in, 
in tradition too, they talk about it. There's a loving God that's expressing itself in that group conscience. There's a lot of juice that's being magnified at the group level. So when I do six and seven, I like doing it at meetings. Yeah? It seems to have a lot more oomph. So I just continually have that possibility. So when, when a pattern is seen, yeah, you're not seeing from it anymore. You're seeing it. Yeah? You catch it at the blueprint stage. You never, you never have to try to get out of a house that you moved in. You never move into the house. It's much faster to get out of a problem that is imaginary. And when it starts taking effect here, because the effect will produce a lot of time, yeah? Let's say if you get arrested, that can haunt you for fucking 20 years. So the whole point is, the value is, is seeing it before it appears in its manifested, manifested state. You want to see it as the mind's drawing it up. Yeah? So once you recognize the pattern, so here we are at meetings and everyone's talking, and you realize, these can't be my thoughts if everyone has them. And then you start seeing that this parasite has taken over all these possibilities, all these different hosts. It has a limited amount of characteristics and they've been identified and, and pointed out in a book called AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And so if you read the book and you read the diagnosis of what the parasite looks like by its effects and you identify, hey, maybe this is your solution. The solution is, is when the host wakes up to that it's a parasite. If the identification of self keeps staying in place, the effects of the solution will be limited, severely limited. Just like it says, the results will be nil unless you let go of all your old ideas, absolutely. The oldest idea is the idea of being a self. Yeah. So that's six and seven. Then you go to step eight which is, okay, now I'm going to make a list of the people I screwed over, the things I did to other institutions and everything else like that. Yeah, just make a list. And it usually comes out mostly out of the fourth and fifth. And then there's, an, there's another way of looking at it, because sometimes I rob stores where I had no fear about or resentment, but I owe them amends, so I write them a down too. You know, I owe them amends, i got to go pay them and stuff like that. So I do a list. Yeah? And then I just, become, I just become willing to make amends, hopefully direct amends, to those people I've harmed. Yeah? This is so good to do. You, it's very important to have a sponsor to go over stuff because you don't want to spring an amend on someone or, some, or at the wrong time. I try to make an amend when I first got sober to a lady. I felt at the time that I brought her into hell because she was, seemed to be really nice before when she met me. And by the time our relationship was over, I had shown her a lot of stuff, a lot of hellish things, and she was pretty much flipped out. So, of course, when I got in, I feel very uncomfortable about that because all this stuff starts coming back and I don't have any way to disassociate. I'm not drinking and using. So I, I found out where she was working and I called her up. She was working at this uh, restaurant. And I asked to speak for her, and she came to the phone. She hadn't seen me in about two years. And I'd been, I'd been sober like six months. And I said to her, as soon as she heard my voice, she says, I never want to hear from you again this lifetime. So in a way, it didn't go well, the amend thing. Because I wasn't ready. It wasn't the appropriate time. I was doing it to feel better. So, but now at step nine, I'm in a different position. So now I, I, I have the list, and I start, I'm open, I'm willing to make direct amends. And what happened with me is the amends that I had been conveniently avoiding for years found me. In the weirdest of places, I'd run into people, and my first reaction was to run or to keep driving, and then I'd pull over because of AA, and I'd say, hey, come over here. I owe you 45 bucks for that phone bill I did, you know, I skipped out on or something like that. So I started to make the amends, step nine, and to me step nine was probably the most powerful, had the most powerful effect, because my attention and interest was wedded to the past, yeah? I had so much unfinished shit that I couldn't, there wasn't, there wasn't enough of, quote unquote, the real act of me, which is my attention and interest here. It was all wedded to avoiding that shit, not dealing with it, which is all the disease of managing, yeah? Instead of just being done with it, I just avoided it. And so it was like, had so much space in my head. And the, one of the simplest examples was, there was a place in San Francisco that I, had, I used to live nearby, a market, and I used to steal from it, like every day. 
I had a long jacket, you know, so you could put stuff in. I'd go in, I'd steal two 16 ounce beers and a steak or something, put it in the back, and I'd have food and I'd have enough drink with the hopes of holding off till I could get some drugs, yeah? Did this for months. And there was a meeting in North Beach, this area, and parking was at the premium, no place to park in North Beach. And there was a meeting there. And I never thought about this place unless I was going to that meeting. And then I, I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't park, even if there was a space there, I wouldn't park there. This went on for months. And then one day I finally said, I'm going to go in there and make amends, yeah? So I went in there, I asked him, and it's, where's the manager? I went upstairs and I went to the guy and I said, hey, you know, I used to live around here and uh, I'm in a program of recovery and uh, I need to make amends to, to the store. I stole a lot of stuff here and I, I only had like 50 something bucks. I gave him the 50 something bucks. And, and it, he looked at me like, what? And he just took the money and I left. And you know what? I never thought of Rossi's Market again. That's what you're freed from. That preoccupation. All that space that's being rented to all those unsolved mysteries up there. Yeah? It's, it, they're being, that's keeping your ability to be here. It's already taken. It's beholden to that. So I was freed from that. So I realized how great this dust was, so that really invigorated me, and I wanted to get the amends done, where before I was trying to, I would want to do this, hey, this works. And so I did my amends, and that's where the real sense of freedom occurred for me, to tell you the truth. I, kept, I, didn't have, I wasn't looking over my shoulder all the time, literally and figuratively. You know? The attention that had been wedded to that came back right to the only place it's valuable, which is now and interest, and it enriched my life. I was able to really start enjoying being sober. So step 10 is that we continue to take personal inventory. Yeah? And when we were wrong, promptly admit it. You know, don't put it off, because again, that's what I do. I avoid and disown, and then it just keeps taking up more and more space. I gotta pay security cards to keep it hidden and not, you know, it becomes a huge freaking investment. So promptly is important. So this inventory process is similar to the fourth step, but it's not a big house cleaning. You're just going, oh, what did I do? And you can write some of your accomplishments and things that are working out for you. You can talk about it. It's not always defects. It's telling you what's going on. And then when you see that you own amends, attempting to do it as quickly as possible, because people like to rush into meditation, but nay, nay without a clean house, nothing's going to happen when you attempt to have improve your conscious contact with the higher power through prayer and meditation if there's so much static going on. So step 10 is how to keep the house clean. Yeah? And step 11 is, or, is also preceded by an inventory. Make sure that gets through. And then it says, we're going to improve our conscious contact with this power that's demonstrating all, these, all this benevolence in our lives through prayer and meditation. Yeah? So that's step 11. So for me, now there's not, it doesn't, and it says why, because in a way, the daily reprieve from this alcohol is, going, is contingent on the maintenance of your spiritual condition, yes? So the 12 steps for me diminish a mental condition, that's what they do. They don't produce a spiritual condition, you are a spiritual condition. They diminish a mental condition that's eclipsing the spiritual condition, yeah? It can only seemingly do it, but it's seemingly doing it. Yeah? When the mental condition is brought down, then what was always so becomes obvious to you, and that's where the value in what's always so is, is when it becomes obvious to you. There's no real value to what's always so if you're not knowing it. There isn't. It's as if it doesn't even, it's not, it has nothing to value. So here, the mental condition's now sufficiently been diminished that I'm aware, I have a, I have a consciously aware of that presence. Yeah? So as long as that thing stays down, yeah, I'm in contact. So what happened with me over time, not immediately, because I got into prayer and meditation and stuff like that, was I realized the, ba the highest form of maintaining, maintaining a spiritual condition is to be a spiritual condition. When you realize you are a spiritual condition, that's the highest form of maintenance. Yeah. Being a spiritual conditioning is more, you can't do enough hours of meditation to match being a, a spiritual condition. You can't. You can't do enough prayers. You can use every second of every day praying. It's never going to be like being 
a spiritual condition. Yeah? So when you're weaned off of being a mental condition, or an object of a mental condition, and you realize you're a spiritual condition, that to me is the highest form of maintenance of the spiritual condition. So that's step 11. And then step 12 is, okay, having had a spiritual awakening, now, a lot of people have spiritual experiences. They're not spiritual awakenings. Spiritual experiences do not lead to spiritual awakenings. Spiritual experiences, you can collect tons of spiritual experiences. It doesn't add up to a spiritual awakening. Spiritual awakening is on a different ball level, different game. It's not an experience. It's a state. Yeah? It, it influences all your experiences. All your experiences will be infused from that state. It's not an experience, so it's not a spiritual experience, it's a spiritual awakening. So the mind wakes up to its own nature, which is of spirit, of no-thingness, yeah? And after having that, I'm going to practice these principles, these steps, in all my affairs, and if you can't do it in all your affairs in the beginning, limit your affairs, if you can, <laughs> and just do, practice it in the affairs you can practice it in, yeah? And I'm going to help others achieve, you know, sobriety. I'm going to help others, I'm going to support other people's attempt to get sober. That's going to be my agenda from now on, yeah? That's going to be my primary aim, is to pass on what was freely given to me to others. This is how I maintain what aspect of keeping that spiritual awakening alive, because in AA, you have it by giving it away. Yeah? You can't have it without giving it away. What you have, if it's not given away, ain't it. Yeah? You have it by giving it away. Yeah? And that's just, and then that just continues on and on and on and on and on in the program. They don't, that doesn't change. After having had the spiritual awakening, practice these principles in all your affairs and help other people achieve, and I think, what does it say? Achieve sobriety and, and, and maintain your own sobriety. There you go. Now the steps, the first few steps, the first one is just, you go over your own life, there's the, all the evidence. The second one is observational. The third step is the possibility, you make a decision about it. Then four through nine is the work, you do some work. And then 10, 11, 12 maintains what that work produced, which is diminishing of a mental state. So that that clarity of the spiritual condition can be the dominant influence in your life every day. And by giving it away, by practicing in your principles, that's how that stabilizes. Some people like to do the steps over and over again, whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah. To me, to me, it's a point where you become a free-range alcoholic in a way. Yeah. You've been freed, even from AA, in a way. People think if you're free from something, that means you leave it. No, I attend more AA than I ever did, probably. Yeah? Because the whole point of AA is not another way of getting bound. It's to bring freedom from alcoholism. And for me, the root of alcoholism is identification as self. Yeah? Even as an alcoholic self, even as a recovered self, just a freedom from self. Whatever form or identification it wants to align itself with, you're free also from that. Yeah? So that's it. This short little thing. And if I shared tomorrow, it would be different. I'd see it in a different way. Basically in the same, similar way, but I would say it differently. Because it's a living solution. This isn't freeze-dried. It isn't something that you have to thaw out and defrost. It's fresh. You're the living, you're the living expression. And for me, the living expression of AA is the freedom from alcoholism. Yeah? That's the living expression of it. Whatever degree of freedom from alcoholism you're demonstrating is demonstrating the essence of AA. That's what they supposedly said one of the titles they were going to use was Freedom from Fear in the book, the big book. Yeah? Because that being such a dominant influence in one's life. But so 
That's as succinctly as I can put it for a short stretch of time. And I may explode if I keep going. So I'm just I'm leaving this realm right now. I'm going to need help. <laughs> From your viewpoint or your observations over 25 years, what are the po like the positives and negatives of AA, or what are the positives and what are the limitations of the 12 steps or AA? The personalities in it, the principles are sound, totally sound. One of the big uh, warnings in AA is uh, place principles before personalities. Once the conditional mind finds a solution, it will try to make it a problem. That's what it does. Yeah? That's its innate tendency. And then a, a sad thing in my life is I came to AA, never been to it. Yeah? My relapses came after programs that didn't have AA in them. I spent three months in one, and I got... I split and I got loaded, and then I spent two years in another one, and I got loaded when I left there. I've never gotten loaded since I came to AA. But there's a lot of people that AA, they go in and out of AA. Yeah? And, they, and in a way, they deter themselves from getting the real, what would probably be really, really valuable for them, which is a bottom. Because as soon as it gets bad, they run into AA for a week or two. Well, they go to a couple of meetings, and then they, they have all the jogging down, they get a commitment, they get service, but they go back out. And it's, I've watched some people do this over and over again for years. I never had that possibility. I hadn't entertained that idea, because I hadn't been introduced to AA, you know? So when I got into AA, it became a done deal. I became convinced, and it's been over, and I've had, this, I've had the, the result of AA where it says, you will cease fighting everyone in anything. You'll be placed in a position of neutrality with no thought or effort on your part. The problem will not exist for you anymore, which is an incredible, an incredible state. After something had so much influence, I mean, its roots ran deep into my life, alcoholism. It affected my relationships, everything, my health, every fucking thing. To have that seem to not exist is a damn good solution. When I see it, how the mind can make that solution a problem, flips me out. But that's what happens. You know? People come in and out, and in and out, and in and out, and in and out, and in and out. And they, I, I see it as a disservice sometimes to, from keeping someone from their bottom. Yeah? You've got to be discriminating and helping. It's got to be led by some intuition. Because sometimes you're doing a disservice to people. The best teacher is life. And the way a lot of us learn is getting our asses royally kicked. And if I'm trying to save someone from that, it's just going to be elongated in time. It's just going to be worse and worse and worse. Yeah? So when someone doesn't want it, fuck it, great. Don't take it. I'm not going to spend any time with them. Let them get loaded. That's, going to be, that's what's going to give them the ears to hear. Not me yapping. Life's going to kick their ass enough, and hopefully they'll be malleable to entertain another possibility. Yeah? And after a while, you learn a lot. You read. You can read people. You can hear where they're at. And it's like pointless. You're not serving them. You're just trying to blow your own bubble up, you know, how great you are. Yeah? So, so that's my feeling about it. I think AA is an incredible program. Sound. I think it's the greatest. I've seen more demonstration in AA than any other group I've seen in the world since I've been here. <clears throat> I definitely believe there's grace in it. A lot of grace and a lot of possibilities. The only dilemma with this place is because this is a subjective experience, without the willingness, you could create the perfect application on a computer that could, someone could use that could keep them from all the temptations of drinking. But if there's no willingness for the user, that application has no value. Yeah? If the person doesn't want to use it, it will not have an effect. That's the dilemma here. 
And the dilemma in with the disease of alcoholism, the disease tells you you don't have a disease. And you're sitting there nonchalantly thinking you have a choice when you're screwed. You don't see that there's no choice. You don't see where you're at. So you think an hour is drudgery. Go to an hour of meeting out of my busy life? I can't do that. I've got too many things to do. If someone had cancer and they were told if you just follow this simple 12 step program and you could have a daily reprieve from cancer for the rest of your life, they'd be freaking knocking the doors down to go to the meetings. Yeah? This alcoholism kills more people in America than cancer does. Easily. Easily. But it's a disease of mind. You can't take an x ray of it, you can't see it. It's not in your elbow, it's not behind your liver. Its infection happens in your thinking and your perceptions.